Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benun. you're watching Israeli News Live, and uh, guys, we are, we're doing two things at one time here. We have live stream running here on uh, Israeli News Live on live stream. Uh, thank God bless all of you that are watching. I have no idea who's watching. I have no idea to see what comments are said or anything because I'm here in the saddle. I'm having to use a handheld mic because we're going to be looking at what CNN released here uh, uh, October the 3rd today about carry an elite audio. I lost the argument, it says, for the use of force in Syria. But he says a lot more in this, but it's getting even more serious. So let me go right now to the breaking headlines before we come back and analyze some of this, this leaked information here. I think it's important that you guys see this. U.S. has suspended bilateral contact with Russia over Syria. You heard that right. They have suspended the bilateral contacts. Now, uh, this was said by John Kirby today. Uh, we don't know as of yet how serious that is. It seems to be pretty serious from Russia's point of view, and I'm going to get into that in just a moment here. But according to uh, what the statement says here, they're not suspending their, their, their uh, at least they're working together over flying over Syria. But I wouldn't trust that either if I was in Russia's shoes, especially from the leaked information there, because uh, uh, John Kerry does talk about going in there and taking out the air defense system of Russia in that leaked document that came out today. I really want, I want to thank Brother Steve. Uh, we're going to go into that in just a minute, moment here, uh, who actually did this video up for me, sent it to me here. Uh, God bless him for doing that. He en en enhanced the audio, got the volume up on it where we'll be able to hear it better. That's why I'm using a handheld microphone. I want to get right back here on the screen where not only you can see these things here, but you can also uh, hear what's being said. So those of you on live stream, if for some reason it's not loud enough for you guys, definitely go to, um, uh, to our uh, YouTube channel on Israeli News Live and follow it up there. But let's go back again. So the U.S. has suspended the bilateral contact with Russia over Syria. Now, this is the State Department document, and I want you to look at this very closely. I'm going to blow it up so you can see it the best we can. I hate this stupid Facebook thing. Let, let me, I actually saved it on the desktop. Let me go there, and let's open it up right there. Um, I know I have it in here somewhere here. Um, where did I put it at? I don't think I give it any particular name, and that's that's the that can be the issue sometimes there. Uh, but I did save this document because I wanted you to be able to see it. Uh, there's specific wording in there. It's very serious, and um, oh goodness, I just hate it when I can't find something here. Um, Okay, let me do, I'll have to go back here again on the internet, guys, to show you there. Um, I don't know how to get rid of the Facebook thing that's on there. Anyway, it says the suspension of participation in bilateral channels with Russia established uh, to sustain the creation of hostilities in Syria. The statement by John Kirby, spokesperson, October 3rd, 2016. As you can see, U.S. Uh, Department of State title on your screen there in the back, background there. Now, it goes on. Let me, i got to reduce it down a little bit because everything is getting in the way and nobody can probably see anything here. Um, okay, here we go, here we go. We can look at it a little bit bigger here. Maybe I can blow it up here without all the garbage getting in it. Okay, so the U.S. State Department Office for the, uh, of the spokesperson, John Kirby. Watch what it states here in the article. The United States is suspending its participation in bilateral channels with Russia that were established to sustain a cessation of hostilities. This is not a decision that was taken lightly. The United States spared no effort in negotiating and attempting to implement an arrangement with Russia aimed to reducing violence, providing unhindered humanitarian access, and degrading terrorist organizations operating in Syria, including Daesh and Al-Qaeda in Syria. Unfortunately, they blame Russia here. Russia failed to live up to its own commitments, including its obligation under international humanitarian law. 
and UNSCR uh, 2254, and also either unwillingly or unable to ensure Syrian regime adherence to the arrangements to which Moscow agreed. Rather, Russia and the Syrian regime have chosen to pursue a military course inconsistent with the cessation of hostilities as demonstrated by their intensified attacks against civilian areas. Targeting of critical infrastructure such as hospitals and preventing humanitarian aid from reaching civilians in need, including uh, through the September 19th attack on a humanitarian aid convoy. Now, see, this is what gets me, guys. That's a flat-out lie. There is no proof that Russia nor Syria, now, I'm not saying they didn't do it, but uh, there's, not a, there's not any evidence that shows that they did. All right? Now, I know that there is a possibility that retaliation they may have, but let's back up a moment and look at who broke the ceasefire. Now, someone leaked out the document showing what the agreement was all about, what was written in the agreement. It's been published all over the internet, all over the news and everything. And one of the key factors in this was that it was a no-fly zone for both Russia and the United States. But three days into this, and you're going to find out from the leaked document, John Kerry, they would not accept the cessation of hostilities unless Russia guaranteed a seven-day no-fly zone over Syria. Well, guess who breaks that no-fly zone over Syria? It was the United States coalition who bombed the Syrian army only three days into this. And guys, I'm there looking over Damascus when the ceasefire is broken and all H-E double hockey sticks breaks out to the east of Damascus and then to the north of Damascus. So the rebels that are there are trying to gain and get control of Damascus, and they begin to launch the attacks there. And, of course, the Syrian army forced to do nothing else but to retaliate back or either have Damascus overrun, which we do know is another issue altogether. But biblically, you can look at that and see that that is something that's coming, according to Isaiah 17. Nonetheless... He says here, the U.S. will also withdraw personnel that had been dispatched in anticipation of a possible establishment of a joint implementation center to ensure the safety of our respective military personnel and enable the fight against Daesh. The United States will continue to utilize the channel of communications established with Russia to, to deconflict counterterrorism operations in Syria. No, they don't. I mean, we have to tell, you have to call it like it is. The evidence is stacked against the Obama administration for direct support of Daesh, ISIS, whatever you want to call them, in launching the attack over in Del Azord, uh, uh, Del Del Azord there in eastern Syria that caused a tremendous loss of life for the Syrian government. But anyway, they pull, they're pulling their people out. Normally when you're pulling your people out, it's a sign that you're fixing to go to a major conflict. All right, now, Russia, no doubt, is expecting that this may escalate to a very serious situation. Let me show you why. This right here, Rosetta.ru. That's how you say Rosetta in, uh, in, in um, uh, the Russian language right there. The title of the article right here is saying that Russia... Uh, and I actually put a little notation here for you right here. that The title actually says that emergency ministers hold training on civilian defense with the participation of 40 million people. That's what the title says right here. What are they doing? According to the article right here, written in Russian, to show you right here on your screen here, on October the 4th through the 7th, there's the word October in Russian, 4th through the 7th there, they have... 40 million Russians across the country will be participating in the drills going into underground bunkers. All right? 200,000, 200,000 uh, personnel will be activated in working with this massive drill across Russia. In, in DEF CON, I clicked on DEF CON before I come on just to see if the nuclear alert level had been raised. No. I, you know, maybe the reason why the, the, the alert system's not raised in America is because they're not worried about Russia sending over nukes. They're worried about the United States sending nukes into Russia. Now, anybody that's ever seen the documentary The Way Home, uh, or Crimea, The Way Home, that was produced by the Russian uh, uh, state media, 
they produced this. Putin spoke about uh, the United States and, their, and the NATO coalition coming into the Black Sea, and we were all being told that they're doing a, a drill. Putin said it was not a drill. They were coming to try to take Crimea back, but they had no idea that Russia had already made such advances and were ready to fight for Crimea if that's what it came down to. So in light of what Putin has said, I have to ask myself the question, is this a drill or is it not a drill? All right? And, like I said, what does it say? Put just the top part of the article. Russian emergency situations ministries will hold the all-Russian exercise of civil defense in which more than 40 million people will be involved, according to the RIA in Novosti. Now, here's the serious part of this, guys. They also, in another article that was sent to me by uh, a, a beloved sister there, Stella, she sent me an article, sends me many articles all the time, a lot of you guys do, and I thank you for them. Believe me, I see these articles that you're sending me on a regular basis, just I can't cover all the news stories that we actually get in. But uh, thanks to Brother Steve with this uh, here, and then also with Stella sending me uh, another article where Russia, uh, they're working with the nuclear drills in Moscow, and they actually have enough facility to be able to, to evacuate the entire population of Moscow and to put them underground, and they had the provisions to take care of the entire population of Moscow underground in case of a nuclear strike on Moscow. You know, I saw one person, we did just a quick broadcast on this saying, you know, wouldn't it be nice if the United States would do something like this for their people? No, they don't care. I guess the Agenda 21. you got to remember, Putin said he is against the New World Order, and he says he'll never go to a cashless system, and he also said that, uh, oh, what was I going to tell you there? Uh, oh, I forget. Anyway, so he's against the cashless system. He's against the New World Order, and he's not going to bow down. He's, and we're already seeing this quite clear. Uh, I see another article breaking. There's no alternative. Ooh, it, it popped down before I could catch it, popping up there on the phone there. Um, so anyway, so the deal is off, all right? That's, that's all we can say. Um, the deal is completely off with Russia as of right now. We don't know uh, which direction it's going to go at this point here. It more than likely can only get work, uh, worse. Moscow, Washington failed in its Syria co uh, commitments, tries to shift responsibility on Russia. We already know some, some of the other breaking articles that are going on right now. All right, so now let's, let's get down to business with things that are going on. Uh, we're going to go into Seymour Hirsch, by the way, here in just a little bit here uh, as we begin to show that, not to say that Putin doesn't have their own issues. I, I, I'm not here to defend Russia. What I am here is to uncover truth and what's really going on. Uh, for the sake of the American people, for the sake of the Israeli people, uh, for the sake of the Russian, for the sake of the European people. I care about human life, and I see that we're about to end up uh, into a situation over Syria that could spiral out of control into a complete global conflict. All right, let's take a look here. Let's go right here to the video here uh, that um, Brother Steve put together for us here. I have marked some different things that I want you to be able to hear about on this video uh, in regards to specific things that are being uh, stated in, in the video. Uh, we're going to go to the 11-minute mark here. Let me just pull where we're at here. And you're going to, I want you to listen to some of these things that are being stated here. Okay, let me get it right at the right place. Close as I can anyway. Here, um, this is where they're going to be talking, and John Kerry is searching for video evidence. I'll go into that in just a moment. Let's listen to it. Syrian civilians, marketplaces, even our own team, the Syrian civil defense team. We've documented since the start of the Russian uh, intervention in Syria, from day one until February of this uh, year, more than 17 of our Syrian civil defense personnel have been killed by Russian strikes. Do you have any videos of, of the airplanes being struck? I have this one video mm -hmm. and it has been a lot being fired up. Can we get, I mean, I've been looking for videos for ages, I've been asking for them. I'm looking for videos. 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 I'm looking for videos
Now they're going into the translating of the document there and, and what uh, they're translating. Let me repeat that again. They're translating what's being said on there. Now, John Kerry is asking for video evidence uh, that supports that these people have been killed. Uh, that, you know, they're saying that 17 of, the, of their own civil defense, uh, this is the people with the Free Syrian uh, Army, or not so much, they're, they're not the army. Let me do, let me clarify that. The people he's speaking to is not the, 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 the Free Syrian Army. These are Syrian people that want to topple Bashar al-Assad for one reason or the other. Now, it, when you listen to this, uh, this particular document here, uh, and I'll put a link in, uh, especially for those of you on YouTube. I can't do it on Israeli News Live live stream because we're broadcasting live here. I will place it on the YouTube there for you guys so you can see this uh, that Steve did because he does enhance the audio where you can hear this a little bit better. But the thing about this is this so serious is when you listen through this entire broadcast here, one thing you're going to pick up on, this is a religious war. Sunni is against Shiites. They talk about that in here. They're open about it. The Shiites killing the Sunnis. It's, it's just insane what's going on. But you've got to remember, the Sunnis, the Vatican backs the Sunnis, but they don't back the Shiites. All right, now, let's move on. Um, uh, we're going to go to the 18-minute mark here. And let me get you here to 1848. And listen to this part here. Well, the problem is the Russians don't care about international law, and we do. And we don't have the basis, our lawyers tell us, unless we have a UN Security Council resolution, which the Russians can be the Chinese, or unless we are under attack from the folks there, or unless we are invited in. Russia is invited in. By the legitimate regime, well, it's illegitimate normally, but by the regime. And so they were invited in and were not invited in. We're flying in airspace there where they can turn on the air defense, and we have a very different scene. The only reason they're letting us fly is because we're going after ISIS. If we were going after Assad, those air defenses, we have to take out all the air defenses. Uh, and we don't have a legal justification, frankly, for doing that, unless we stretch it way beyond the law on a humanitarian basis, which some people argue we should, by the way. Uh, but so far, American legal theory has not bought into the so-called right to protect. Uh, and we don't even have what we had in Kosovo, where we had a, you know existing resolution. Okay, let me bring you up to speed on what John Kerry is speaking about at this point here. Uh, one, he does call President Assad, he calls him the legitimate regime. Then, he's, then he goes and he says, well, not illegitimate in my mind is what he says there. But he says, we've not been invited in. He's trying to justify what they need to do in order to be able to get involved in the conflict. It reminds me very much of Iraq. Uh, when uh, you could not, George Bush could not get the support of Congress, per se, uh, but they used the humanitarian, they used the, uh, you know, the weapons of mass destruction were there, etc. All these excuses to be able to go to war with Iraq. Now, the same thing is what they're running into again, and this is what he's talking about. Uh, he's saying how that they, they, they were not invited in. He said Russia was invited in. Um, he speaks about how that this is becoming, uh, you know, that, you know, it, it is a problem for them, uh, which brings me to another issue altogether. But, um, but then he speaks about how that they could only go in if they were attacked or if it's a humanitarian crisis. And, of course, now that we see that they have cut off the bilateral, and let's look at that again. The bilateral, um, okay, wait a minute, Did I, I must have closed that. Let me try to see if I can pull that back up. Um, the bilateral uh, agreement, here it is right here, 
that is spoken of here by uh, John Kirby. He says, unfortunately, Russia failed to live up to its own commitments, including its obligation under international humanitarian law. And you just heard him say on here, especially those of you that will be listening on YouTube, you'll be able to hear a little bit better. And I apologize, live stream guys. I, I, I don't know if, uh, friends, if you are able to hear that that well. But he was saying that they have to have a humanitarian reason. He says many are arguing that they've got it already to be able to justify to go in. But if they go in, he also mentions how that they would, he said, if we go after Assad, we will have to take out all the air defense systems to be able to do it. He said, right now we're flying over Syria because we're going after Daesh. And he's not really going after Daesh either. That was the whole issue when Russia came in. And there's where the monkey wrench comes into this whole scene. When Russia came in, Russia was the only one that really dealt with Daesh and really was effective by doing it. But you're going to find out. They didn't do much about it because they were wanting Daesh to take over. They were wanting ISIS to win the war and to topple Bashar al-Assad because they felt like they could work with them better than they could Assad. Imagine that. All right, let's continue on back to the, uh, the video here. And uh, let's look, because we're going to get to several other issues on this here. We're going to go to 2342 in the time zone here on it. And... Um, and this is where he speaks about that they're arming certain groups in here. Let's take it right there. Hezbollah, the Ba'abas, the Iraqi and the Iranian groups are not fighting the United States now, so they are not uh, targeted by the attacks against terrorism in Syria. They kill well, Syria they, are, they are targeted by the opposition. <laughs> Let, let me tell you what he says here, just in case you're not hearing it very well, especially on live stream. They're asking about why are not Hezbollah and the Iranians being targeted. Uh, now, John Kerry is going to give his excuses why they're not uh, targeted, because he'll say that Hezbollah is not a direct threat to the United States. Uh, he said they are a threat to Israel, but not right now they're not being a threat to Israel. But he does say right there that they are being targeted by the resistant forces there, the ones that they are arming, okay? So I'm going to back it up just a little bit, and I'll let it go a little bit further, but that's what this whole issue is about. Why are they not doing it? And he talks about that they are, okay? They're not fighting the United States now, so they are not uh, targeted by the attack. Now, I actually backed it up where I left it off at. They are, they are targeted by the opposition. And we are arming. So, and training. Okay, I will object to that. Can I? Sure. I'm from Aleppo, and I'm a social media activist. So I worked for six campaigns over Aleppo in the last six years. Do you know how many there for Aleppo? How many social media campaigns asking for protection for Aleppo? Maybe one or two. In Aleppo, we have six. We have almost each six months we have one. So it's not a, to me, convincing me it's a battle against ISIS is really hard. Because we lost Daria. Daria is like our sweetest romantic dream, the revolution. And we lost it last month. So what we are moving forward is another experience of Iraq, where ISIS is there controlling half of the country, half of the population feels that it's an existence battle and their only exit within it will be ISIS. So I don't want this scenario for Syria. So you mean, you, we are arming people to fight for Syria? I don't think we are. I think in reality, we are not arming the hurt people, you know? That's why we are losing Aleppo right now. And I don't want to be here next year when we're going to discuss how we lost Aleppo and there is still Idlib and Iraq. So in reality, there is not enough political and armed support to those who consider them moderate. I wish we had his friends, not because they don't respect the international law, but because they are his friends. Well, let me ask you, Michael. I mean, I think we've been putting an extraordinary amount of arms in, haven't we? Yeah, and I have to say, as you said, it's a double-edged sword, because you give people the ability to defend themselves 
But when you pump more weapons into a situation like Syria, it doesn't end well for Syrians because there's always somebody else that's willing to pump more weapons in for the other side. Um, the groups, the, the armed groups in Syria get a lot of support, not just from the United States, but from other partners. And we've never said that that Qatar, was Qatar, Russia, uh, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia a huge amount of weapons coming in, huge but, amount of money. But pumping weapons in causes someone else to pump more weapons in, and you end up with a level. I mean, the reason, the reason Russia came in is because ISIL was getting stronger. Daesh was threatening the possibility of going to Damascus and so forth. And that's why Russia came in, because they didn't want a Daesh government. And they supported Assad. And and uh, and we know that this was, this was growing. We were watching. We saw that, that Daesh was growing in strength. And we thought Assad was threatening. Uh, we thought, however, we could probably manage, uh, you know, that Assad might then negotiate. Instead of negotiating, you got Assad. Now you got the group to support him. So, okay. it's, it's truly complicated. I mean, you know how complicated. Look at what he's saying now. One, John Kerry says in this audio recording here that not only do they, not do they support the moderate rebels, but he speaks about all the different countries that are involved in supporting all the different groups, and he puts it in the plural. So they all, and these are all the allies. He says Qatar, Qatar, in other words, uh, Turkey, the Saudis. He names those three countries right there that are supporting these other groups that are inside the country there, and arming and pumping in arms like crazy. And of course, now Turkey is actually crossing to the border to fight themselves directly. So it's not just arming the oppositions, and it's not just the opposition. It's al-Nursa, it's, it's al-Qaeda, it's, it's Daesh, ISIS, whatever you want to call them, ISIL. But if you'll notice, John Kerry says in there, because up until the time the Russia came in, supposedly, the United States was actively involved going to get rid of ISIS out of Syria by doing different bombings throughout Syria. But he sits there and tells, right now, tells these people here they were watching. Daesh already had about half of the country under its control. But it began to get dangerously close for them to take Damascus. And he said, we were watching it. And we figured maybe this would put the pressure on Assad to work with us but it failed, he said, because we, they, he didn't expect Russia to step in. Now, him not expecting Russia to step in uh, is very, very biblical in itself. Uh, let's, let's look at that real quick, all right? We can, we can pause it on YouTube. We'll pick it back up in just a second. Give me one second. I want to pull this up for you guys. If you look at Daniel or if you look at Ezekiel 38, I want you to look at both of these just for a moment. Let's take, let's take Daniel first. Um, Daniel 11, especially, we're going to come back here in just a moment. We're going to look at what John Kerry says in here um, that catches my attention as well. Okay. And at the time of the end, verse 40, chapter 11, Daniel shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and shall enter into the countries. All right? The word countries in Hebrew is right here. Be'arotz. Arotz or Eretz is land, but it's in the Vavtav, which is plural. I know most of you guys that are learning Hebrew, you, it's Yod Mim. You think that's the masculine. This is the feminine because the earth is considered a feminine uh, creation of God, so in the land. So they come in with many. Rabaot, uh, Uba'ah, Be'aot. They come in and they, they're going to overthrow many lands. This is exactly, I hope our battery doesn't die here, those of you watching on live stream. If it does, again, I apologize. I, I have to do it this way in order to be able to get more things on there. All right, so they're coming in. They're, they're coming in there to take over the lands. All right, and with the ships and shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. He shall enter also into the beauteous land and many countries shall be overthrown, but he shall 
but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Adam, Moab, and the ch chief of the children of Ammon, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt, shall not escape. That's what's going on now. Egypt, Ethiopia, all right? Remember, and that's what it's going to say here in just a second. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and over silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And, uh, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Excuse me. Can somebody tell me, everybody wants to try to say the king of the north is Russia. Who's the one attacking Libya? Who's the one attacking Ethiopians? It's the NATO. They're the ones destabilizing the nation. That's why Russia recently did an article about now the U.S. is going after Africa. Because why? Of the oil. There's oil there. They discovered it down there in Ethiopia. Well, you know, Gulf Oil International, huge stockholder, happens to be the Vatican. Think about it. But here's where the problem comes in. Verse 44, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall affrighten him, and he shall go forth with great fury to destroy utterly to take away many. That's where we're at, guys. Friends, I know some sisters tell me, Brother, don't call me a guy. I apologize. I love you all. I really do. I don't mean to say that. Um, anyway, 13 were just killed at a Kurdish wedding in Syria. A report just now breaking this coming out now on RT here. Uh, that's what we're seeing happening. Tidings out of the north. And this is what you're going to find out in a second because, again, John Kerry is going to say, we didn't expect Russia to enter in. That's something that caught him off guard. And I'm going to go into a thing, too, about the false prophet. You're going to find out something I'm going to do on that here in the next day or so here. I'm going to show you where that false prophet comes in. It's those who have made the false prophecies about the biblical eschatology and everything else that have put Russia in the crosshairs, and we find out that in reality it's not been Russia in the first place. I know that's going to be hard for people to take there. Ezekiel 38, the war that everybody looks mega. The son of man, set thy face toward Gog, the land of Magog, and the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee about and put hooks, plural, and it isn't a plural right there, and uh, into thy jaws. The jaws are also written in the, uh, the, the Hebraic plural there. Uh, and he's going to bring them down. Bring you forth in all thine army and horses and horsemen of all them clothed with most gorgeously a great company with buckler and shield and all of them handling swords. Sounds like a NATO force to me. Persia, Cush, put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands in the house of Togomrah and all the uttermost parts of the north and all his bands and even many people with you. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou on guard for them. Uh, guarded of them. After many days thou shalt be mustered for service. In the latter years thou shalt come against the land that is brought back from the sword and that is gathered out of many peoples and against the mountains of Israel which have been in a continual waste but it is brought forth out of the peoples and they dwell safely all of them. And thou shalt ascend and thou shalt come like a storm. Thou shalt be like the cloud to cover the land and thou and all thy bands and many peoples with you. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall come to pass in that day that things shall come into, into your mind. Thou shalt devise an evil device, and thou shalt say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages, and I will come up upon them that are quiet, and that they that dwell safely, and all them that dwelling in walls, and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, and to take the prey, to turn thy hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and against the people that are gathered out of the nations that have gotten cattle and goods, and dwell in the middle of the earth. Sheba Didan Tarshish goes on to say and everything like that. Uh, they're going to ask, are you come to take a spoil? But you know, there's one place in here where it says that they, they just have no regard for human life. Now some might argue, that's Russia. That's Iran. You know what? Where does that, let me, let me see if I can find that real quick, where they, don't, they have no regard for the human life. That's what I want to find real quick, see if I can find that. Wow. You know, you have your two witnesses right here in verse 22. And I will plead against him with pestilence and blood, and I will cause to rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him 
an overflowing shower of great hailstones and fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So it's not just Israel that he makes himself known to. I have to go back and find that on the one about um, where they have no regard to life. Let me just clarify, though, what I believe that is. Because uh, I know many of you probably already know about this and which scripture that is. The part where it speaks about that they have no regard to human life, I believe, is because the United States is using all these radical Arabic Muslim groups, such as Daesh, such as ISIS, such as Al Nursa, the Free Syrian Army, all these fighters they've brought in to try to topple Bashar al Assad, they have no regards for life. That's where it comes in at. And, and by the way, just to prove that point right there, let me just share. This is what I was going to bring up earlier. This is Seymour Hirsch, famous uh, British journalist. What does he say here? Hirsch says, Hillary approved sending Libya sarin to, to the Syrian, Syrian rebels. The great investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch in two previous articles in the London Review of Books, uh, Who's Sarin and the Red Line and the Rat Line, has reported the Obama administration falsely blamed the government of Syria's Bashar al-Assad for the Syrian gas attack that Obama was trying to use and as an excuse to invade Syria. Hirsch pointed to a report from British intelligence saying that the sarin was used, didn't come from Assad's stockpile. Hirsch also said that the secret agreement in 2012 was reached between Obama administration and leaders of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar to set up a sarin gas attack and blame it on Assad so that the U.S. could invade and overthrow Assad. Imagine that. And now we have Aaron Erdem, who's sitting in a Turkish prison right now because he was bold enough to come out and expose this very thing as well. You see, they have no regard for human life. They used the radical Muslims, ISIS, to do this sarin gas attack on civilians. Now, I don't know if the civilians that are, the Syrian civilians that are working with John Kerry in these secret meetings, if they really know that this is going on or not. But watch what some of the other things that are said in this meeting here. Let's go to um, 3350, I believe, will be the next spot here. So you can hear what's actually stated. I think you're looking at three people, four people in the administration who have all argued for your support. And I've lost the other. I've argued for your support. Four I people said, uh, argued for the use of force. We're going to attack us because of the weapons. And then, you know, things evolved into a different process. But the bottom line is uh, that we, the Congress refused even to vote to allow that. Tony Blair went to Parliament, lost that vote. Okay, I have one question then. What is the bottom line? How many? How many students? What is the bottom line? Because chemical is there and it wasn't the bottom line. Hospitals, it was the title. You mean the red line? Yeah, no, no, what is the end of it? What we can do and to be the end of it? Well, Not clear? I, think, I don't know because I am. I, I think people are watching right now. Before I play the next part, let me just say something really concerned me of what this woman here said. She says, What can we do? that'll make it to be the bottom line. Because John Kerry's talking about the sarin gas attack in 2013, and he argued for being able to go to war, but the U.S. Congress knocked it down. And he said Tony Blair also wanted to go to war, but he was knocked down by his own parliament. So just like Hirsch says in this statement right here in the leaked report, Seymour Hirsch says, the Obama was trying to use an excuse to invade Syria, Hirsch pointed out to report from the British intelligence saying that the sarin that was used didn't come from Assad's stockpiles. Hirsch also said that a secret agreement in 2012 was reached between the Obama administrations and leaders of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar to set up a sarin gas attack and blame it on Assad. And that goes in line with Aaron Erdem when he, uh, he was a parliament member for Turkey, but he 
clearly had the evidence showing that they had smuggled in sarin gas through Turkey by ISIS, also smuggled in nearly 2,000 men to fight in Syria that he had evidence of. But at the same time, as Aaron Erdem brings it out, the former MP for the Turkish, mili uh, Turkish government, later states that this was the same time that the sarin gas attack was used, shortly thereafter when they were free to go inside of Syria and they were allowed to take their sarin gas with them. And he said the Turkish government turned a blind eye to it. Again, so it, it backs up Seymour Hersh's argument that indeed they have been planning this all along. The Obama administration, that's why John Kerry was for the fight, for the war, they wanted, he wanted to justify it. But it all falls apart. Now let's watch what else he has to say here. Deeply frustrated as you are. And we are talking about what enforcement mechanisms could we now take. And it may be that we will lift up the options because of the frustration, because of Assad's indifference to anything. So there's a different conversation taking place because of what's happened in the last few days. We'll see what happens. Now, he says there is a different conversation taking place now as a result of what happened, okay? Then we find out they cut off the bilateral communication with Russia. They're planning on doing an attack. They're, just, they're, I can't see anything else. Let's go to 35, 45 seconds, only a few more seconds after this part here. I'm going to start it at 42 seconds, and I want you to hear this as well. No fly zone. Well, there's more and more talk. We're trying to get what we call an agreed upon no fly zone. Uh, and that's what we're trying to get. The Russians have agreed that if we get this process going, Assad won't fly. And that's what attracted us to this equation was the idea that we might get a no fly zone. But if we're going to force a no fly zone, we have to attack every air defense. And then we have to be willing to fly airplanes every day to enforce it. And it's very costly and very, it's a big deal. On the long term, I think it's cost effective. What? On the long term, because if we did it in 2012, we would have been without ISIS. If we do it in 2013, right now in 2016. So cost well, effectively? Well, 2012, a lot of us were saying we should be sending people in and helping you. I'm frustrated too. I, I get it. I'm, you know, everybody at this table wants to do more. So it's a frustration level, but they are talking about what to do. Now they're talking about going in there. And if you heard what John Kerry said, they're talking about taking out all of the defense mechanisms that the Russians are using, all the S-400 systems. That's what they're planning on doing. No wonder why then we see that the Russians are in the middle, 40 million people going into the bunkers. Now according to this, it's a drill. Is it a drill or is it something that serious? How many people are just gonna be thrown out under the bus, so to speak? It's part of the Agenda 21 plan, perhaps. Depopulation of the Earth. Don't worry about telling the Americans. Seems like only the Russians care about their people. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Be safe. We'll be praying for you guys. Pray for us as well. And we'll be going to the front lines, if that's what it takes, to cover what's going on. Erev Talk.